So now that we've established the cells that help the nervous system, we're going to now be looking at the different ways that the nervous system within vertebrates is so complex. We stated that a complex vertebrate is going to have a true central nervous system and a true peripheral nervous system, but we didn't really talk about what that means to be a true central nervous system. And that's what we'll do in this first flowchart on the central nervous system. We'll entitle the flowchart CNS for central nervous system and break it down into the central nervous system's two main components. That is, of course, the spinal cord and the brain. We're going to spend much of the end of this lecture focusing on the brain, so the brain will just be uh, very simply highlighted uh, here in this flowchart. We're going to spend the majority of this flowchart focusing on what makes the spinal cord so complex. Now, the spinal cord is going to be a structure that's specifically there in order to link the brain to, to itself. This is going to cause a link to form between the brain and the rest of the nervous system. So it's a very important structure that makes sure that the brain can connect and speak to the rest of the body by having this connection, this linkage here. So in order to understand the spinal cord, we're going to, of course, look at two main ideas, its structure and its associated function. So let's take a look first at its structure. The spinal cord, very simply speaking, is a small central and hollow canal. So let's write that down. It's a small central canal. And whenever you think of a canal-like structure, that just means that the structure itself on the inside is hollow. So it's not filled with anything. In addition, um, we're going to basically highlight what the central nervous system spinal cord uh, consists of on its outside and on its inside. And that's going to be stated in the following manner. There's going to be something referred to as gray matter. Gray matter that surrounds the canal, so it's all around. And this is going to just be, gray matter is generally in the nervous system world and language, it just means a structure or a component that contains no myelin. So there's none of this. So that would mean that in this part of the central nervous system, you of course would not expect those glial cells, oligodendrocytes, to be functioning because those are the ones that make myelinin. And if you have gray matter, which means you have no myelinin here, that's not going to be present in this part of the central nervous system and this part of the spinal cord, therefore. Now, in addition to what surrounds the canal, there's going to be something that surrounds the gray matter itself. And that's going to be known as white matter. In the spinal cord, what you'll notice is white matter that's on top of and surrounds this gray matter. So let's write that down. White matter surrounds the gray matter. Now the white matter in the terminology of the nervous system, whenever you're speaking of nervous system uh, ideas, this white matter simply means that there is myelin. So overall, on the inner part of this canal, there's not going to be myelin, but on the outside part of the spinal cord, there will be myelin, and that's where you would expect oligodendrocytes to be functioning in order to create white matter. So therefore, white matter is created by oligodendrocytes, and gray matter does not have any oligodendrocytes floating within it or anywhere near it. So that's our basic orientation. There's white matter around the gray matter, and the gray matter is interior to the white matter. In addition to this uh, gray matter, white matter structure, the spinal cord also contains cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. And the purpose of this, we sort of highlighted it before, but we'll just put it into words by stating that the CSF is this very important fluid of the nervous system, cerebro and spinal fluid. That's why the name is there. It provides hormones to the nervous system, specifically the part of the spinal cord right now. It provides nutrients and it also takes away metabolic waste. So anything that the spinal cord needs to get rid of will be mixed with the cerebrospinal fluid and filtered out in a different process that we don't need to get into the details of. So provides hormones, nutrients, and takes away waste. That's a good sort of overall look at the CSF of the spinal cord. In addition to this structure that we've highlighted now, let's take a broad look at the function of the spinal cord on this side of the flowchart. So the spinal cord has many functions, but we can break it down into basically three main components. The spinal cord is going to be important for the following. It transmits, let's rewrite that, transmits impulses, which again are just neural messages, the way that the nervous system talks to each other and other parts of the body in impulses. So it transmits those messages to and from 
the brain. So it's a very much message relayer to and from the brain. So messages will be sent to the brain, brain will recognize, figure out what to do with it, and send a message back out to the body. How? That's going to be to the, to the brain via the spinal cord and then from the brain via the spinal cord. So that's a dual function there. And in addition, the spinal cord also controls some of its own uh, associated functions. Now the brain we know is the central control organ, but the spinal cord actually has some control capabilities and that's going to be in reflex actions. So let's take a look here. The spinal cord controls reflex actions. Reflex actions are simply going to be involuntary responses to stimuli. So you cannot control this. So these are involuntary responses to stimuli. Thus the term and name reflex. In addition, reflex actions are going to be those that are predictable they will always happen the same way every single time and they will also be termed as autonomic. They occur automatically without any influence from you. So they're predictable and autonomic and also because of this predictability and autonomaticity, let's say, they are going to be these actions that are reflexes that are coming from the spinal cord. They are totally independent of that central control. They're totally independent of any brain influence whatsoever. So these are going to not talk to the brain, not be sent to the brain, these actions. They're going to be exclusively a part of the spinal cord's overall function. So let's take a look at a classic example of this. A reflex that many people are aware of is the knee-jerk reflex. So let's look at this example as the knee-jerk reflex. So this is when you go to the doctor, you sit on the table, and you're hit with that hammer-like thing that's going to cause your knee to just automatically kick forward. Now, this reflex action is not controlled by you. You can't control this. It just happens. And it happens the same way every time. It's predictable. It's autonomic. And thus, it's involuntary and independent of the brain influence. It must, therefore, be occurring due to spinal cord function. How so? Take a look at the simple pathway of this knee-jerk reflex. What we notice in this process, in this reflex action, is that the knee will have different sensory receptors that can sense things, that notice, let's say, a hammer has just hit the knee. The knee sensory receptors detect that, and specifically, they detect a sudden stretch in the quad muscles. Sudden stretch. Let me rewrite that stretch in quad muscles. So when that tool hits your knee, it's actually hitting a part of a quad muscle that will be then be sensed by these sensory receptors. That has to then go to some sort of processor. Something has to recognize that sensation. So the knee, and the, specifically the sensory receptors, will take that information, that sort of uh, hit that's happened at the knee, that information will be sent not to the brain right here, it's a reflex, so it's going to be sent to the spinal cord. So we do not go to the brain. We just go to the spinal cord. Then the spinal cord itself is going to integrate the information. So remember what we mean by integrate. Spinal cord integrates info. That means that the spinal cord is going to be the one involved in understanding what this information is, and not only understanding, but responding to whatever this information is, whatever the sensory stimulus was. The stimulus was a hit to that part of the knee. That caused the stretch of those quad muscles. That stretch information was sent to the spinal cord. Now the spinal cord has to respond. How does it respond? Well, it does two major things. The spinal cord will utilize and tell motor neurons so motor neurons are those, these are the effectors. These are things that will cause us some sort of effect. And the motor neurons are going to tell the quads, the quad muscles, to contract. That's what causes the kick up that you feel or uh, see that's exhibited upon this hit to the knee. This contraction causes the quad, this of the quads causes that movement. But in addition to this contraction, there's actually going to be a simultaneous relaxation as well to ensure that this reflex occurs correctly. There's also going to be these interneurons. Remember, those are integrators of messages that are found in the spinal cord that send information these are going to separately send information 
to the hamstrings. So this is the opposite muscle, the antagonistic muscle to the quads. And therefore, it will tell the hamstrings to relax. And if the hamstrings relax and the quads contract, you basically get a kick. All of this was done without the brain. So write this in big bold letters here. There is no brain influence in this. It is a very quick, predictable, autonomic, involuntary, independent action of the brain. That covers our look at the functions of the spinal cord and the structure. Briefly, the brain, what we just are going to highlight for right now is that the brain contains ventricles. Ventricles are just cavity structures. Just write that down for now. And the brain is sort of the opposite in this gray matter, white matter uh, orientation. Here, what we notice is that the gray matter surrounds the white matter. So it's the exact opposite. So gray matter surrounds the white matter in the brain. So that would mean that is there myelinin on the outside of the brain? So that means the gray is on the outside of the brain. Does gray have myelinin? No, as stated over here. So there's no myelinin on the outside of the brain, but on the interior part, past the gray matter, there's white matter. That's what will contain the myelinin. And also the brain will have access and be within CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, a brief overview of the brain and how it looks basically is shown in figure 49.5. And that covers our look at the central nervous system. What we're going to be doing later is highlighting the brain in greater detail towards the end of the lecture. Now we'll look at the peripheral nervous system.